Today I will be talking about introduction to ecological design and regenerative architecture. Actually, this is our course uh, that we are running at uh, Ecodemia and today's session is going to be uh, the introductory module, um, the, a summary of the introductory module of this course. Actually, in this course, we have plenty of uh, connections with ecological thinking, permaculture design, transition design, regenerative landscape design, passive design, in addition to architectural and urban design. So this course stands somewhere in between at the connection point of all these knowledges and disciplines. Um, this course aims at transitioning our mindsets, how we think about our environments, our design approach and practice from a consumption-based, environmentally degrading and socially exclusive one towards a more sustainable, holistic, inclusive, ecological and regenerative one. These ideas, principles and techniques may be applied to many different scales, but for the purpose of this course, we are focusing on the scale of house and community design. And today's course, as I said, is going to be a summary of the introductory module of our four weeks course. My beginning is going to be actually why we need an ecological design and regenerative design approach to our current um, design practices and understanding our environments. Uh, so as a humanity and as our planet, we are facing a very huge uh, crisis situation. Actually, it is, I think, uh, today it is uh, manifested in the current spread of uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, we are facing many other uh, enormous problems. And many of these are resulting as a resu resulting uh, because of uh, human activities. Uh, we see the we are living in an age of Anthropocene, called by many scientists and researchers. Uh, so one of the main issues is what we call business as usual. Uh, the way that our economic system uh, runs and our society is organized around, around the current civilization and society is or organized around. Uh, so this business as usual approach has a competitive imperative of grow or die. It is a, a profit-oriented approach with a, at the expense of environment, human beings, ecosystems, indigenous communities and health of planet, in planet Earth in general. So uh, in the running of business as usual, natural resources are privatized and they are seen as economic assets and therefore they are externalized. And there is a huge dependency on fossil fuels and individual consumption. Um, so, and this is the sort of result of current economic situation and urbanization. Uh, how human beings' habitats are uh, created and organized in um, current civilization. Um, of course, human beings are a part of planet Earth and uh, throughout the history we have been shaping our environments according to our own needs, but uh, the environmental changes that human beings produce are so much different than um, other non-human beings. Uh, we as human beings act upon our environments with a great technical foresight. However, that foresight lacks ecological ideals in many cases. We are the only species, species in fight with nature and which tries to dominate the nature and dominate each other. All our material and non-material needs are met in centralized ways through mass and industrial industrialized production, such as energy, food, water, consuming goods, housing, health, education. All domains of our life are controlled by these centralized systems. We have very little information and very reduced roles to play in the meeting of these needs. For example, how our food is produced, how our houses are built, where the drinking water comes from, or how we access to health services, especially these days, these issues started to be even more visible and uh, crucial for many people uh, in the world. So there are many consequences of these, uh, this living system and this economic and uh, social system. For example, one of these issues and maybe one of the most important of them is uh, deforestation. 
we lose trees at a rate of 50 soccer fields per minute as our food systems destroy our ecosystems. And most of this degradation occurs in the developing tropics of Africa, Latin America and South and Southeast Asia. So many, especially many underdeveloping or underdeveloped countries are being affected from these changes. Another issue is we are losing the very precious topsoil, which is full of organic matter essential to life due to agricultural practices, erosion, drought, climatic anomalies. Another issue is we are facing um, massive extinction of uh, many species. For example, um, within the last, last 50 or 60 years, uh, wild human populations are increasing. And in addition to that, the livestock populations, the uh, majestic uh, wild animals in nature, their numbers are decreasing. And it is not only these uh, huge uh, vertebrate animals, but birds, insects, and plants. A lot of species are losing, uh, are um, because either they, 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 are, they are extinct or they are face to face with extinction, risk of extinction. So what we are doing with our planet, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the uh, concept of Earth Overshoot Day. That day marks the date when humanity's demand for ecological resources and services in a given year exceeds what Earth can regenerate in that year. So, as you can see here, starting from 1970, there is a gradual um, decline in the uh, time of the Earth shoot day. So, it is coming backwards and backwards uh, each year. So, this means that uh, we are uh, consuming up uh, the following year's resources, which means the next generation's resources. So if we continue this way, this graph will continue falling down and uh, uh, where it takes us uh, is a disastrous question for all of us. Uh, so here you can see uh, the consumption patterns according to different countries. And if all of us uh, consume, for example, uh, if all the countries consume uh, like uh, United States, we would be needing five planet Earths uh, to meet all our demands. And currently, we don't have. So we need to uh, think about uh, all our consumption patterns, um, food systems, building, construction, um, industries, uh, or design approach and practices. And we even need to question the uh, idea of sustainability or current green design, ecological design technologies, because the current sustainability understanding um, is sort of failing at one point, because is this the situation that we are going to sustain? This is one question that we need to ask. What are we sustaining? And how could a really sustainable uh, future be established? So we need to be questioning these concepts as well. And here again, you can see how, our re how, how we are running out of very precious resources uh, on the planet Earth. And unfortunately, with the increase of uh, population of human beings and unjust distribution of resources, poorer countries and people suffer from these conditions more severely. Um, for example, Climate change affects the poorest in developing countries, and even for the more developed countries, the poorer population are being affected by um, such kind of crisis situation, climate change, uh, lack of food, or even the pandemic itself. Uh, and unfortunately, the countries who contribute the least to emission of greenhouse gases will be the most impacted by Impact, uh, impacted by climate change. And when we look at the global hunger index, these two, these two maps are being overlapped with each other. The hunger, climate change, uh, energy consumption, um, and such kind of issues, they are all uh, they show they all show a similar pattern, these maps. So the more poorer countries are suffering more than more from these issues and poorer populations in developing countries as well are suffering from these problems. And while a lot of 
people are suffering from hunger. There is a very critical issue of food waste and food loss all around the world. Uh, approximately um, 40 to 50 percent of very valuable food is being uh, lost or wasted uh, during the harvesting, transportation processes or in the supermarket shelves or after they come into onto our tables. And while this food, this much food is being wasted, uh, a lot of people and especially children die out of hunger. So we are living in such a critical condition because of uh, current industrialized mass production, our consumption patterns, our design of built environments, urbanization, uh, food systems, and the current civilization is organized around. So many people are uh, forced to live in slum areas, for example, which might differ in size and characteristics, uh, which lack reliable sanitation services, supply of clean water, reliable electricity, law enforcement or other basic services. Or many people are facing, for, uh, facing with um, political clashes, wars and unfortunately Mediterranean Sea has turned into a cemetery for refugee people for many years and a lot of people are being forced to live in uh, refugee camps and of course such kind of exclusions, um, poor living conditions um, are not only happening in such kind of refugee camps, even in the most developed uh, countries, in the most um, affluent countries and cities, you can see homeless people, people being evicted from their homes, uh, people being excluded uh, based on their such kind of exclusions. Um, inequalities are sort of embedded within this current culture. So definitely something needs to be done and um, we need to change our mindsets. Um, as a summary in the business as usual mentality, we see nature as an economic asset. We dominate and exploit nature, species and other human beings. And these issues are embedded in our society and culture. The current civilization with the systems that it had created for food production, urbanization, businesses, education, health is not functioning anymore. And the problems we are facing today, such as climate change, pandemic, social inequalities, rising totalitarian regimes, discrimination and fascism are manifestations of this. And we need a different approach to all these problems. And when we look at our problems, these are all systemic problems. They are all interconnected and interdependent to each other. They cannot be understood separately from each other. Therefore, they cannot be solved in isolation from each other. So here we can very shortly talk about uh, mechanistic and organic um, approaches to society. So uh, the mechanistic one, which is mostly dominating our uh, definition of societies, current civilization, and especially rising, starting from the industrial revolution. The mechanistic view uh, sees societies as composed of isolated and competing individuals. Uh, so the societies must be externally managed through hierarchical, centralized and bureaucratic institutions. However, organic societies are self-organizing beings in relationship with one another, collectively creating an, an entire ecosystem. Therefore, humans can create decentralized communities and societies. So we need to change our understanding and approach, of so approach to our societies and uh, current organization of societies from mechanistic, indiv individualistic, which focuses on um, parts rather than the whole towards a more organic one, um, which I will try to um, simplify here. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, through an interdisciplinary dialogue between psychology, biology and ecology disciplines, the foundations of a new thinking was established. 
and at the forefront of this thinking system uh, was the universe is no longer seen as a machine composed of elementary building blocks. Uh, the material world is a network of inseparable patterns of relationships and the planet is a whole uh, living and self-regulating system. So this new conception of life involves systems thinking, thinking in terms of relations, patterns and context. A living system, an organism, ecosystem or social system is an integrated whole whose properties cannot be reduced to those of smaller parts. So systems thinking involves a shift of perspective from parts to the whole, from objects to relationships. These relationships are among the system's components, but also between the system as a whole and larger system that surrounds it. The relationships between a system and its environment is called the context. So systems thinking is always contextual thinking. And a forest is a, a very good example of this uh, holistic approach. A uh, forest is composed of many layers like trees, bushes, fungi, roots, climbing plants and etc. And of also a lot of animals, insects and microorganisms are living in a, in a symbiosis in the forest. On the top layer, uh, there is pollination, flowering, fruits, evaporation, photosynthesis. On the bottom layer, there is decomposition, water storage, water filtering and soil formation. And the forest sustains itself with, without any external energy or support. The only energy resource is the sun. Actually, all ecosystems function in a similar way. All these connections create the web of life and even the smallest organisms, for example, bees, have such a great contribution to this web. As human beings, we are part of it and whatever we do to the web, we do it to ourselves. Whatever we are designing, we need to keep in mind this holistic understanding. The more connections we have in between different components, the more sustainable and resilient a system is going to be. It can be your backyard, it can be your neighborhood, district or a city. So in its very basis, ecological design is about increasing the amount of these meaningful connections and create a system that can support the web of life in its variety and multidimensionality. So, before I continue with what is ecological design, I would like to very shortly touch upon what is not ecological design. Uh, for example, um, maybe you are familiar with these green building rating tools, um, but most of these tools um, we can criticize them for being having a more mechanistical approach, dividing the site into its components and looking at uh, each uh, element as a point uh, in the design process. And especially the concerns for ecology in many uh, green building rating tools are usually subsumed under other categories with other landscaping concerns, such as sustainable sites or land use. Um, and most of the green, well-performing buildings are usually measured according to energy efficiency. And only energy efficiency is not sufficient to obtain ecologically sound um, buildings, neighborhoods and environments. We need to have uh, other dimensions. We need to create connections between other issues as well, not only uh, energy efficiency, but water, carbon dioxide, waste, materials, the whole uh, process of design, uh, the social, cultural and economic context of the project um, and many things. Of course, energy issue is something very important. Uh, it doesn't mean that we, we can underestimate it because um, buildings have a great contribution to uh, consumption of fossil fuels. As you can see in these diagrams, almost 50% of the whole energy consumed on, on our planet are because of um, buildings, either their embedded energy or their operational energies. Um, so then what is ecological design? As a brief definition, 
Uh, ecological design can be defined as any form of design that minimizes environmentally destructive impacts by integrating itself with living processes. This integration implies that the design respects, for example, species diversity, minimizes resource depletion, preserves nutrient and water cycles, maintains habitat quality and attends to all other preconditions of human and ecosystem health. Um, so there are some critical questions that we need to ask to ourselves when we are designing anything. Does it enhance and heal the living world or does it diminish it? Uh, or does it preserve relevant ecological structure and processes or does it degrade it? And very basically, we can summarize the principles of ecological design as uh, solutions growing from place. So it should, these should be um, contextual um, designs, ideas. Um, every project should be growing from uh, taking, um, every project should be properly connected to its existing context and environment. So all the solutions should be place-based, um, not something applied in another place and exactly being implemented in the location, but location-specific um, information values uh, should be embedded within the design. There should be ecological accounting of uh, how we approach to um, current environmental conditions and are we um, enhancing the conditions or are we diminishing the conditions? Designing with nature, uh, designing with um, designing in consideration with the natural flows, for example, sun, wind, uh, topography, soil, biodiversity and existing ecosystems, how we approach to these and how we integrate these in our design processes. Everyone is a designer, is the uh, participation of all the stakeholders um, who have, um, who are going to be affected by the design and who have, um, who, who might be benefiting from the design and making nature visible uh, is another important principle of ecological design uh, because in many of our designs um, we are losing our connections uh, with natural world, natural life. So how to approach to ecological design and thinking through regenerative principles if we talk about these uh, very shortly. Um, here you can see a table uh, which sort of compares conventional design practices and regenerative design practices. So in between you can see green design, sustainable design and restorative design. So as we go towards regenerative design practices, uh, our use of energy, environmental impacts, environmental degradation, social exclusions and uh, other problematic issues will be decreasing and uh, we, will be create, we will be having a more positive environmental impact, both in terms of ecology and social impacts. So if we want to talk about some, some of the key principles of regenerative architecture, we can um, uh, talk about these issues. For example, the only constant is change. Um, so keeping change and continuous evolution in mind. This means um, designing for evolution means uh, to treat change not as an enemy, but as a source of creativity. Uh, we, we usually approach to projects from the mindset that change is something we are working to prevent. But this places us in conflict with living systems, trying to hold them in a state of uh, status. The, the alternative is to harness energies of change and to, to be able to benefit from the changing conditions. And another uh, thing is creating diversity that can exchange value because diversity is about exchanging value, just like in the food forest example. Uh, it's not only the elements that are important, but the relationship between these elements. 
So a, a diversity of elements such as organisms in an ecosystem or buildings on a site uh, will be adding value if there are um, meaningful and beneficial exchanges of resources, energy or material exchanges, exchanges between them. For example, a forest doesn't become healthy because it contains a long list of plant and animal species. It becomes healthy when those species actively nourish and shelter one another in an unbroken web of uh, beneficial relationships. Another example can be a downtown shopping district, for example. Um, it is more likely to foster a vibrant city economy when it is filled with local businesses that rely on local manufacturers rather than with national chains. Um, adding value is a nested phenomenon. So thinking about our projects being nested in a bigger system is always important because living systems are always nested in other systems. They are always part of some larger living systems and they are made up of smaller living systems. Each living system contributes to the value adding processes of the larger system within which it is nested. And that system in turn contributes to, contributes to an even larger system. For example, our cells are a part of our tissues and they are a part of our organs and the organs are the part of the whole body. If we think about human beings. So we usually tend to um, design in, an, uh, in, an, in a way that we don't see these connections between uh, bigger scale and smaller scale systems. Uh, so the potentials of our projects um, cannot be realized at its uh, full, uh, at its complete level. Um, again, as an example, when small and local businesses uh, in a city center are replaced by mega stores, Local money no longer absorbs into the local economy. Social interactions fostered by small businesses dry up and the uh, city center downtown may become abundant. So we need to think about this uh, nestedness issue. Um, another uh, key principle is uniqueness, uniqueness to plays, partnering with plays. So one of the most important issues of regenerative uh, architecture is uh, the understanding of place. For example, what makes each place unique? What gives its vitality or viability? What is the source of its potential and therefore of its capacity to evolve? With this understanding, it becomes possible to uh, tailor sustainable design strategies and processes that are harmonious with the character of a specific place. For example, here there are some questions we can ask. What are the patterns of nestedness? For example, an urban school can affect its neighborhoods and therefore it can affect the larger community surrounding that neighborhood. Or a rural school can affect several small communities located within a watershed. Each school can play a different role based on their integration within a unique set of nested system. Or we can ask what are the patterns of interaction in a place. For example, um, if we think about a place's different layers, we can think about first geological substrate of rocks, soils and spaces between them. This geological substance interacts with climatic forces and further microorganisms such as fungi, plants and animals and this builds their fertility and provides a matrix for ever increasing complexity of ecological expression. And then all these environmental conditions start to interact with um, human beings, habitats and cultures. So all these geological, microbiological and uh, human uh, interactions create uh, the unique essence of place. And Last but not least about the places, uh, what are the patterns of essence? How people describe the places? How do they express it? What they love about it? This can be summarized as the spirit of place, the living ecological relationship between a particular location and the persons who have the right from it and added to it uh, the various aspects of their humanness. 
And last but not least, we can talk about collective aim and action, which means um, having a, a collective aim for people uh, to discover their own aims and uh, to be able to work in the same direction. Uh, so this also includes the participatory dimension as well. Uh, when we create a collective aim and action, uh, this will create a path to a more sustainable um, future for the community. As an example for this one, for example, a degraded watershed uh, can be needing restoration. When a community uh, takes on the responsibility, they can organize uh, their talents and resources to restore the watershed, uh, its hydrological function, uh, but they can only restore uh, their uh, collective working together, their uh, collective action, um, collective being. So this, when you can provide this uh, collective aim and action to a group of people, then these people have the opportunity to um, take responsibility of their uh, vocation, take responsibility of whatever the project is being designed. Um, so as a designer, you don't have to continue um, the initial uh, excitement of the project, but uh, it will be um, located and embedded within the uh, community's own dynamics. So this is why it is important to create participatory, pro participatory processes, collective aim and action. And this collective aim and action can be, um, should be also responding to other principles as well. It should be grounded in a deep and pattern based in, within the context of the site, within the context of the web of life uh, of the existing site. It can uh, depict the place's potential within its region and beyond in a way that local people experience as authentic, meaningful and significant. Um, it is integrative and holistic that bridges cultures, uh, generations, um, and nature and people. It can be translated into people's personal aims and principles that people also find um, excitement, joy, and relevancy in their own lives and works. And it is capable of serving as the regenerative resource for direction of a project. So it provides a um, collective vision for people as well. So people will be knowing uh, in what direction they need to move. So to um, finish with, I would like to uh, take a quote from um, Gideon Kosov. He describes the transitioning to a sustainable society uh, will require the reconstitution and reinvention of households, villages, neighborhoods, towns, cities, and regions everywhere on the planet as interdependent, interdependent, nested, self-organized, participatory, and diversified wholes. The result will be a decentralized and diversified structure of everyday life which in contrast to the centralized and increasingly homogenized structure that we have become accustomed to. So I think these, uh, some keywords here are representing um, this ecological and regenerative approach. Uh, interdependency uh, of each element, creating these meaningful connection between each interdependent um, household, community, uh, city, or different uh, scales and levels, being nested to one another. So wh whatever scale we are talking about, thinking about the bigger scales and the smaller scales. Uh, Self-organizing, so having a collective uh, aim and action so that people can be organized around these principles and uh, they have a vision for the future. Uh, participatory and diversified, so with the inclusion of each member of the society, each stakeholder of the uh, project, let's say. Um, the projects can be implemented uh, in a stronger way and they will be even more uh, belonging to their original contexts. And diversified holes, um, diversification is very important. 
uh, in terms of um, uh, being able to meet all our needs uh, at more local scales, from food to energy, from water to uh, housing needs. Um, so that's all that I wanted to talk about uh, in today's talk. And here you can see a four weeks uh, outline of our ecological design and regenerative architecture course. Um, it will be starting on 16th of January and will last four weeks every Saturday between two and six, uh, according to British time. So in week one, we, we will be talking about philosophy and basic principles of ecology and regeneration. Uh, pathology of contemporary architectural design and ecological design thinking and regenerative design principles, a little bit more uh, extended version of today's talk. In week two, we will be dealing with uh, site planning, uh, how to um, ecological, how to design sites in an ecological and regenerative ways, from how to design, um, how to be responsive to context, how to produce energy, how to become water and carbon dioxide positive, how to increase biodiversity, how to become no waste and how to increase biodiversity. In week three, we will be mostly focusing on passive design strategies, um, solar architecture. And in the final week, we will be discussing about the designing the design process. Uh, this includes starting from the end, uh, what happens after our buildings or projects uh, finish their um, lives, how they are going to be treated afterwards, um, how do the buildings or sites evolve, what are the materiality. So this includes design, construction, occupancy, post-occupancy uh, processes. And meanwhile, there will be some computer applications. And um, at the end of the four weeks, there will be... Um, um, project presentation of uh, participants. So that's all for today. Thank you very much for your participation and listening.